Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of What the Dementia by Bamboo Care. I'm your host, Brianna Wilson. I'm a certified dementia practitioner and the founder of Bamboo Care. So today we're doing another episode on a rare form of dementia. This is one of three rare form of dementias that we have left to cover this year. Now, I know these topics aren't relevant to everyone, but I honestly feel like I would be doing a disservice if I didn't still talk about them, because even though they're rare, they still impact people, they still impact families, and so it's important to talk about, okay? So for today's episode, we are going to talk about HIV-associated dementia, which you may also hear referred to as AIDS dementia, AIDS dementia complex, or HIV or AIDS encephalopathy, okay? So anytime we talk about any type or form of dementia, I always like to start off with what dementia actually is, just so that everyone can be on the same page. So dementia is this big umbrella term to define a collection of symptoms that affect things like memory, thinking, behavior, and emotion, even language, in a way that significantly impacts daily functioning And these symptoms can be caused by a number of different diseases or conditions, okay? So in this case, the symptoms are being caused by HIV. So let's take a step back and talk about what HIV actually is. Because HIV has so much stigma associated with it, I don't want to just assume that everyone knows, okay? So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus which is the virus that causes the HIV infection, okay? And this particular virus attacks cells that helps the body fight infection. And so a big part of HIV is that it makes you more vulnerable or susceptible to other infections and or diseases. Now, HIV is considered a sexually transmitted infection, so it can be spread by semen, vaginal fluids, and rectal fluids, but it can also be spread by blood and breast milk and even from mother to child during childbirth, okay? In the U.S., however, HIV is primarily spread by unprotected sex or the sharing of drug needles with someone who has HIV. Now, normal human contact, like shaking hands or hugging, is not enough to transmit HIV. And unless you have something like mouth sores or bleeding gums, it's very rare to transmit HIV through casual kissing, as it's not transmissible through saliva, okay? So there would need to be blood involved. You also can't get it from coming in contact with items used by a person who has HIV, like toilet seats, doorknobs, or dishes. And even though it may seem like it would be, HIV is not spread by blood-sucking insects like mosquitoes or ticks, okay? So with that being said, to prevent transmission of HIV when caring for someone with dementia who has HIV or HIV-associated dementia, you just want to follow universal blood and body fluid precautions. So universal precautions are the same precautions that you should be using with all people and patients anyways especially when there's a chance of coming in contact with blood or fluids. And of course, if needles are involved in the care of the person, you want to make sure that you're careful and you dispose of any needles properly. But again, this goes for anyone. So there's nothing special, per se, that you need to do, okay? And then AIDS is essentially the last stage of HIV infection, and this is known as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So at this point, the body's immune system is severely damaged, and the person's number of CD4 cells fall below 200 cells per cubic millimeter of blood, and they become more susceptible to opportunistic infections. So CD4 cells are a type of white blood cell, and a normal CD4 cell count is between 500 to 1,500 cells per cubic millimeter of blood, okay? So something that's important to know is not everyone with HIV will progress to having AIDS, especially if the person is taking daily antiretroviral therapy, or ART. If a person is taking ART, it's pretty rare for it to progress to AIDS, okay? 
but since this is a podcast on HIV-associated dementia and not on HIV and AIDS itself, we're going to go ahead and move along into where the dementia part comes in, okay? So neurocognitive deficits are a complaint of about 4 to 15% of people diagnosed with HIV. Not to say that only 4 to 15% of people with HIV have neurocognitive deficits. That's just the percentage of people that they found in a study that have complained, okay? So they may be noticing issues with their memory, attention and concentration, as well as their motor skills. Now, when a person does have a neurocognitive impairment, it is considered HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder or HAND. And all people who have HIV are at risk of developing HAND, with an increased risk if the person also has diabetes, other infections, generally poor health, was older when HIV was contracted, and has a higher degree of immunodeficiency caused by HIV. Now, there are symptomatic and asymptomatic hands. So with asymptomatic hands, essentially the person and those around them really don't notice any cognitive changes, but there are some detectable cognitive deficits through neuropsychological testing. Then we have symptomatic hands, which include HIV-associated mild neurocognitive disorder, and then HIV-associated dementia. And the most common form of hand is the HIV-associated mild neurocognitive disorder, okay? So hopefully you're following so far. So HIV-associated dementia was originally known as AIDS dementia complex, and it was first defined in 1986. And this makes sense to me because the original naming was before art or antiretroviral therapy was more prevalent. And so people were, of course, progressing from having HIV to AIDS. And that's typically when they would experience dementia symptoms in those later stages of HIV, which is AIDS. So it makes sense that its first name would be AIDS Dementia Complex. So prior to ART and then HART, H-A-A-R-T, which is highly active antiretroviral therapy, dementia was actually a common source of morbidity and mortality in people with HIV. But now with heart, specifically, the frequency of HIV-associated dementia has declined from 30 to 60% of people infected with HIV to less than 20%. So heart shows evidence of being able to both prevent and or delay the onset of HIV-associated dementia, which is good. Now, when HIV goes untreated, it can lead to brain damage. And so the ART and heart medications not only help maintain the overall immune system, but also help to minimize the damage done to the brain. Without these medications, the person's symptoms would gradually worsen. In fact, the average survival rate of people with HIV-associated dementia without heart is only three to six months. However, with the medication, a person can live for many, many years. Now, the amount of years is really hard to say because there are so many factors, but there does tend to be a worse prognosis associated with lower educational levels, increase in age, lower CD4 counts, higher viral load, decrease in hemoglobin, decrease in platelets, lower body mass index, hepatitis C co-infection, intravenous drug use, and poor medication adherence. So let's talk about some of the symptoms of HIV-associated dementia. So one of the hallmark findings with HIV-associated dementia is encephalitis, which in this case is swelling in both the brain and spinal column, and this happens when HIV spreads to the brain. So it's important to note that HIV-associated dementia is actually caused by the HIV infection itself, not by another opportunistic infection, okay? Now, as far as symptoms and changes that you may notice, you may notice memory loss, difficulty concentrating, 
difficulty problem solving, speech difficulties, changes in personality and behavior, apathy or disinterest in previously enjoyed activities, reduced coordination, and some people even experience a distal tremor of like the hands, for example. And so the greater the spread of the HIV infection in the brain, the worse the dementia symptoms will become. But its onset is usually pretty slow and gradual, and it's primarily a feature of advanced HIV disease. So usually once the person is at the stage of having AIDS, but not always, okay? Now, once symptoms appear, the dementia then progresses very rapidly if the person isn't on heart. Like I said, if they're not on heart, they usually don't live past a year. It's like three to six months on average, okay? So the part of the brain that seems to be most impacted by HIV infections are the basal ganglia, especially the globus pallidus and caudate nucleus, the hippocampus, and the deep white matter of the brain. Now, HIV-associated dementia does tend to occur in younger people, and it's actually believed to be the most common cause of dementia for people less than 40 years old. Now, dementias like frontotemporal dementia do affect younger people as well, but frontotemporal dementia, for example, is typically diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 65. So that particular dementia is thought to be the most common dementia affecting people under the age of 60, okay? But like I said, HIV-associated dementia seems to be the most common cause affecting people under the age of 40, okay? So to wrap up this podcast episode, let's just briefly talk about how HIV-associated dementia is diagnosed. So first, the person has to have HIV, right? That's kind of a qualifier. But then, just as with any other dementia, it's diagnosed by a rule-out process. So they have to rule out other infections, especially CNS infections, which is central nervous system infections, strokes, brain tumors, other forms of dementia like Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, etc., endocrine disorders, nutritional deficiencies, drug side effects, the whole gamut, okay? And one of the ways that they do this is through CT scans and MRIs to help them detect changes in the brain. They'll do blood tests. They may do a spinal fluid test. And then, of course, any physical testing, neuropsych testing, and mental status screens and tests that may be necessary. So some commonly used mental status screens are the mini mental status exam, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and then there is the HIV Dementia Scale and International HIV Dementia Scale. But truly, the assortment of assessments, tests, and screens that your partner may be given really just depends on the doctor because, again, it really is a rule-out process. And so every doctor has their own way of going about this process, and so it really does depend, okay? So that's just my quick rundown of HIV-associated dementia. I hope that you found this podcast episode interesting and informative. If you do find our podcast helpful, please consider leaving us a review to help others find the podcast. If anyone has any questions, comments, or future podcast requests, remember you can send us an email at podcast at whatthedementia.com. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of What the Dementia by Bamboo Care. We look forward to catching you on the next episode. Take care, and until next time, stay strong, care on, and remember, you are not alone. Bamboo Care is always here.